Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Education Hive. Uh, today, we're very lucky to have with us representatives from Howis DAE, who will be uh, doing a great presentation for us. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, your school and a little bit about your presentation. OK, thank you. Um... I am uh, Miro Stilong. I work as a project manager at the research group uh, connected to OS and to digital arts and entertainment. And we, um, in this talk, I'll talk about how we work together with the companies in our local ecosystem and how we well, try to create a benefit for both the students and the companies. And well, my colleague, Steven, will introduce himself. Yes, um, my name is Steven Engels. Um, I've been doing applied research at uh, DA for around six years. And um, well, for the last two years, uh, some of my colleagues and I have been working with Houdini during our procedural 3D project. And uh, during the pres presentation, I will show some of the work that we've done with Houdini. That's fantastic. Well, thank you both very much for being with us today. And uh, let's get right to it. Welcome to The Level, our main campus for the bachelor's degree Digital Arts and Entertainment. We are part of the University College Hoest, and we pride ourselves to be a practice-focused, atypical and highly innovative school. Digital Arts and Entertainment has the goal to produce alumni with a strong hybrid profile of both technical skill and artistic skill allowing them to successfully integrate into a pipeline both in the film and game industry. We truly believe in the importance of a shared language, so all our students, programmers and artists alike have to at least learn the basics of their counterpart. This formula has proven successful over the years. Our alumni have been well received all over the world. After multiple years of success in international competitions, like the Rookies. Our degree has grown immensely, both in reputation and student numbers. Currently, we have over 1,300 students, at least 315 of them from abroad. This growth has allowed us to specialize and cater our courses closer to the individual trajectories. DIA Research is the research cell of the study program Digital Arts and Entertainment. We're both demand-driven applied research and applied research projects of our own volition are set up. We keep the focus and interests of the curriculum intertwined, continuously linking the research projects to the degree. The technologies that are currently being explored are XR, Procedural 3D, Artificial Intelligence, Computer Vision, Hybrid Ray Tracing, and Motion Capture. At DIA Research, we aim to work on innovative use cases in close collaboration with local companies and organizations, with three goals in mind. One, Scouting state-of-the-art technology we see in game and VFX industry and in academic papers. Two, test this technology in order to update our curriculum with the latest knowledge. And three, help translate this technology to a broader audience to stimulate sector innovation. These three goals help create new markets for our alumni and local companies, which is another important point for us. As a result of this, a big amount of the research projects are oriented towards transferring the knowledge of game technology to sectors other than entertainment and on exploring new game technology, both in hardware and software. As you will notice, some of the demos you see in this video are aimed at innovations in Industry 4.0, healthcare and sports, but also education, construction, heritage and many more. Local companies can work together with us in various ways. 
We support and coach companies and knowledge institutions when starting up a project. From defining the research question, to drawing up a subsidy file and project plan, to execution and following up on the project. This can be upon demand, but we also conduct our own exploratory research. In this, we combine the potential value of new technology and map them to the needs of a consortium of companies that act as a steering committee. An ideal project can start with showing off the possibilities of certain technologies in collaboration with students, or through examples of student work. If there are unexplored technical challenges and questions about the validity of these projects, a DIA research will look into those. These demos and prototypes can help the company to pitch their ID to investors and help them have a good vision on what they want to develop. The final product is then created by a company existing out of our alumni. During one of these projects, we ran into the challenge to create a workflow to procedurally generate a photorealistic content. We noticed Houdini would be the perfect tool to use, as it allows great flexibility in rendering a variation of similar but unique visuals of 3D objects. In this challenging project, a carpet is rendered purely by successively implementing the features of just one hair, the general interaction of neighboring hairs, and their interaction with the environment. Adjusting a single one of those features reshapes the whole carpet, making it a tremendously versatile tool. With this first use of Houdini in a non-game or VFX-related context, we realized it could be a powerful tool that has the ability to create a series of realistic 3D visualizations of new products quickly and cheaply in the very early design phase. To further delve into the possibilities and generate knowledge to pass over to the curriculum, we started our own research project about procedural 3D. Within this project, we look at the possible advantages procedural workflows can have by one, creating small proof of concepts based on questions from a consortium of local companies in which procedural techniques are applied, and two, building up knowledge and passing it towards a broader audience. Hi, I'm Steven. Together with some of my colleagues, I've been using Houdini during our procedural 3D project. I'd like to now show some of the proof concepts that we made. We have made a number of proof concepts to explore different workflows to work with procedural 3D in Houdini. This is an example to mainly get to know Houdini. It was also to get a feel for the difference between parameterizing everything versus random generation from seeds. We used parts of this case to explain the logic and workflow behind parametric and procedural mesh generation to external people and to inspire them to see potential uses for it. This was a small visualization example to use procedural 3D to visualize real-world data. This uses the COVID infection data normalized by population from the World Health Organization and links it to the virtues of the sphere according to their distance to the loaded centroids of the countries. In this case, both the data and the visualizations are questionable. This was an implementation of a script inspired by the Mutagen tool made by Adrian Meyer. It allows to generate variations of an HDA by randomizing the parameters and allowing the user to select parent variations as a basis for the next generation. This uses very basic genetics logic to drive the parameter values. The test implementation allows to quickly generate random creature blockouts that can be evolved into a set of variations based on the preference of the user. With this case, we looked at quickly generating a historical city with a procedural house inside a game engine. For this, we created an HDA of a house and made a tool to quickly create streets of houses and a tool to fill the backyard areas of the houses. We also did some comparisons between building it with Houdini versus building it with blueprints in Unreal Engine in terms of speed and convenience. 
This case was also mainly to get a feel for the development speed between classic and procedural modeling. For this case, we looked at Photoshop as input for a game environment example by SideFX Labs and started from a Photoshop file as well to generate an environment that converts shapes and lines to 3D content. The idea was also to look how different layers can automatically interact with each other. For example, the road needs to have bridges where there is water and the castle wall needs to interact with both water and roads. This way we could, for example, generate 3D environments from old maps. We later also coupled the generation with OpenStreetMap data instead of a Photoshop file. With this case, we showcased how much time it would cost to set up an automatic procedural cropping pipeline from Houdini Engine to Unreal Engine. During this process, different ways of using a propping tool were tested to see the impact of different workflows. This resulted in a final tool where speed, versatility and user-friendliness were key. This was a case inspired by a question from a company that specializes in robots that automatically pick fruits. They use AI to detect ripe fruits ready to be picked. For this, they are looking to create realistic artificial data to train the AI on. And so we looked into ways to procedurally create and grow realistic fruit models. Following the fruiting bodies of a plant, also the leaves needed to be realistically created. We combined this with the question from another company of how the math in papers can be transferred into procedural algorithms. This project was mainly done in Python and then the data was loaded in Houdini to generate the geometry and to bake out the textures. This was a proof of concept case about using a procedural approach to generate the optimal packaging for any object. This could for example be scans from museum pieces that need to be moved. And this would then require for example supports and cushions to stop them from breaking while being transported. We came up with this case because we also had a running project around heritage and the preservation of valuable items. As you can see, we tried different techniques like cushioning, brace packaging and instapack. In order to understand the possibilities of digital cell bodies, and because there are more and more questions from medical institutions to realistically visualize and simulate organs and tissue, we wanted to document the different options available. For this, we did several tests to achieve different realistic behaviors. We looked into vellum and femme and for example tried to achieve realistic slicing of a salt body. This turns out is still quite a challenge. We used the information and the visualizations that we gathered to explain the different options of vellum, femme and also grains to external people and to educate future students. In order to automatically scale 3D clot simulations, we started by creating a uniform mesh from any scanned or modeled person. We did this by finding the joint positions with using the straight skeleton node as a start point. Then we build a rough mesh around the skeleton according to the thickness of the mesh around the joint positions. And in the end, we project the rough mesh points 
onto the original input mesh. This way we had a uniform base to deform the clothing meshes. We did a lot of experimenting to achieve the best results and to fix some issues with for example loser clothing. We also did some plot simulation testing with real 2D patterns. This is a simulation with a police vest that consists of different layers and different pieces. This required some timing inside the DOP network to make it work. What worked best for us uh, in this simulation was to use different wind forces on different parts and to only do the final stitching when all the parts are already in a good place. We also used this example to test different scaling methods. Another thing we did during the project was setting up a node network to automatically find the best fitting patterns for different avatars. This is a proof of concept to make a piece of armor and belts procedurally. The model is built from a few anchor points that can be moved manually or linked to an avatar mesh. The idea being that the heart shapes wouldn't bend unnaturally like they would if it was all just skin to a character rig. The model can also adjust to a bigger person, for example by generating more segments. This takes some time to set up, but like all things procedural, it would save a lot of time in the long run. A lot of logic could also easily be reused. And for example, the procedurally generated plates could be replaced by a nice sculpted version. This is an implementation of the Make It Home automatic optimization furniture arrangements paper from Lapfayu et al. in Houdini. We use the database of 3D models with predefined parameters that influence the positioning and the relations between the objects. We first generate a number of random points according to the number of objects we want to place. Each point then corresponds to an object. According to the parameters of the loaded objects, they each look for relations with other objects. For example, a table will have a parent-child relation with a chair. We then iteratively add a random positional and orientational offset to each object and see if this was an improvement or not. If it was indeed an improvement, the transformation is kept and the next iteration is based on this one. There is an overlap between artificial intelligence and procedural generation. An example of that is the use of machine learning for segmentation of 3D models. Segmented components can be used for design exploration by synthesizing new forms from the modeler components. This can be done on the large model libraries present in a company. We tested and implemented several methods. The segmentation was done using MATLAB and the recombining of the components in Houdini. During this project, we have worked on use cases both with and without Houdini. We believe Houdini has possible benefits outside the entertainment industry and can help our local companies in a way. With our ecosystem, we want to help see these companies what the potential benefits are in their workforce.